My name is Adam Waters. I am the lead pastor of Grace Bible Church in Elmhurst, Illinois, and I just want to welcome you to another segment of our video devotional, A Daily Dose of Psalms. Today we're in Psalm 25. It's a continuation from our study yesterday. Uh, yesterday we studied verses 1 through 10. Today we're going to study verses 11 through 16 and tomorrow, or through 15, and tomorrow verses 16 through 25. Yesterday we learned that Psalm 25 is an acrostic. An acrostic is a literary device used to help people memorize um, the text. So in Hebrew, uh, each line of the Hebrew Psalm 25 begins with the subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So the first, letter, first line begins with the Hebrew letter Aleph. The second line begins with the Hebrew letter Bet, and those are the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and so on and so forth, all the way through to the 22nd letter. And so we can see that, that there's 22 verses in Psalm 25, and there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. In English, many of the Bibles will tell us that this is, in fact, an acrostic in the original. So in the ESV that I'm looking at now, there's a little note that says um, that, that indeed this is an acrostic and that we should read it as one. So an acrostic was used to aid in memorization, but not only that, it was used to indicate or to signal to the reader that the psalm should be read in its entirety. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to read all of Psalm 25 today, even though we're only going to be narrowing our focus down to verses 11 through 15. So let's read God's Word. If you have your Bible, open it uh, with me. If not, just listen, and I will read it for us. Psalm 25 of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. God, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All of the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let, not me. let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. So this section begins in verse 11, and it says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Now I think that even though the ESV clumps this verse in with verses 12 through 15, it's likely in the Hebrew that we should be reading this verse with the previous passage, or the previous section. So as we read in verse 7, David says, Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. In verse 11, he says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. So it's probably likely that that verse underscores or reiterates what David has already said in verse 7 and should be read as, an, as part of a, the literary unit there. And so for today's purposes, we're going to start in verse 12, which begins with a rhetorical question. The question is, is who is the man who fears the Lord? Now, as I said this in the past, but as we read that, we can understand the word man, even though it's the Hebrew word ish, that does indicate um, a male, uh, that the word ish in this instance can mean anybody. Now, David's not just talking about men, he's talking about who's the person. So when we read that, we can understand that to be the case. And it says, uh, who is the person who fears the Lord? Uh, that person will he, that is God, instruct in the way that he should choose. And so it the first real principle that I want you to see as we read this is that God guides the decisions of those who fear him. When we uh, talk about fear in the Bible, we don't talk about um, 
terror or fright or, or, or being afraid to come before God, at least not in the sense that we understand it uh, in English. Um, the fear of the Lord can mean a lot of things, but what I think it really boils down to is worship. Uh, I've often heard it said that fear relates to reverential awe, to having reverence at the majesty and holiness of God, which this is certainly true. But fearing God is ascribing to him those qualities. It is believing that he is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. Uh, fearing the Lord is coming before God and ascribing that, that majesty and giving God his due as our creator. Now, we often don't know what to do in life. Um, it says, him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. So the one that, that fears the Lord will be shown the path. Now, I can tell you from my own experience, and most certainly you can relate to this as well, is that there are many times in life that we do not know which path to take. We might stand at, as a, at a fork in the road, as it were. Uh, many times it feels like there are many options or many possibilities of a direction that we can take. What do we do in that situation? Are we left to what seems best to us? And what is the basis for that? Maybe you're in a, a, something of a pickle right now. You are at a place where you're trying to determine should you go left or right? Should you choose option one or option two? I think what we tend to do as humans is we look in a sort of utilitarian way. We try to see, well, what are the consequences um, going to be? Are we looking at um, the consequence of being good or bad if I choose option A being better than the consequence of good or bad if I choose option B? And many of our, our, our choices or many of our decisions are rooted in this, what philosophers would call consequentialism. Um, but we don't need to do that. We have been blessed and given uh, God's word and God's spirit to live a life that is sold out to him according to his will for our lives, a way that we can trust will always be good. God promises us that our decisions rooted in the worship and reverential awe of him will bring about good. So as you worry about what decision am I going to make, what am I going to do in this, um, what God is calling you to do is to fear him, is to worship him, is to look to him for the answers. When you look to God for the answers, he will guide you. When my wife and I were deciding on whether or not we were going to buy this house, um, when we wrote everything down on paper, it seemed as if it probably was not a great idea. It was not something that we should do. Yet we trusted in the Lord. We prayed to the Lord. We, we asked his will for what it is that we should do. And he made it very clear that he wanted us to live in this house. And in doing so, he's afforded a place to stay for multiple people. Uh, I don't say this to take any credit because had it been my choice, I would not have even have bought this place. But it has allowed God to bless people. It has allowed God to show his uh, mercy and love and grace, his steadfast grace um, to people. And that's been a tremendous blessing, not only for them, but certainly for me as well. Um, I've loved doing what I've been doing um, by providing a place for people to stay, to learn of God, and to be in a family. So um, I had to trust God that he was guiding my decision in that. Now, what are you trusting God for to guide you into? What decision is it that God's telling you right now um, that you want to trust, that he wants you to trust him for? Uh, the Holy Spirit, no doubt, is using these words. Let me say them again. Uh, who is the person who fears the Lord? That person will God instruct in the way that he should choose. There's a way that you should go that you're not quite sure, and God wants to tell you and guide you the direction that you should go. As we move on to verse 13, it says, The one who does fear the Lord and who is instructed in his way according uh, to God's will says, His soul shall abide in well-being and his offspring shall inherit the land. This is um, really the second principle that we can pull from today's passage is that God blesses the decision of those who fear him. So once we make a decision based on the fear of the Lord, once we make a decision looking to him, his power, his majesty, and his um, role as the creator of everything, once we look to him and he guides us in the decision that we should make, when we make that decision, God promises to bless us. The verse here says, his soul shall abide in well-being. Um, that word abide really means spend the night. 
Um, it's used in other places in the Bible where there's either someone is spending the night uh, in someone's home or someone has fallen asleep and spent the night in a place or some object has been left out overnight. This idea, I think, is that um, one will dwell in safety. So if we read it in a more literal way, according to the Hebrew, it would be his soul shall spend the night in well-being. I think what David is trying to say is that the one who trusts God, the one whose decision is blessed by God, dwells in safety. It need not fear the dark time, need not fear uh, that he's exposed or vulnerable, but can place their total trust in the God who's promised to bless that decision, even when it doesn't seem clear to us in our human sort of perspective. Um, it says his offspring will enjoy the fruition, sort of the realization of God's covenant. It says his offspring shall inherit the land. Now, God made a covenant with the nation of Israel in which he promised them the, the, the promised land um, in various sections thereof. And the land is often used to represent the total blessing of God, the ultimate blessing of God. And so what David is saying here is not only will they inherit God's promise that he made um, to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, but that he would also promise um, to bless them and his children, his posterity, as he, he goes on, or his descendants, I should say, as he goes on. So um, we know that when we are trusting in the Lord and that God bless and that God blesses our decisions that have been submitted to him and in and, and faith have been guided by him, that not only will we dwell in safety, but we can expect that those around us will dwell in safety as well. Verse 14 says, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. The third principle that I'd like you to hear today is that God reveals his will and ways to those who fear him. So not only does he guide them in the decision, but he blesses the decisions that he's guided them into, but he also reveals more of who he is, his will and his ways to those who fear him. This word friendship in verse 14 is the Hebrew word sud. And actually it's, it does sort of mean friendship, but it also has this idea of being a confidant, okay? A confidant of the Lord, one in whom the Lord confides a secret counsel. The ESV says, or secret counsel in the footnote there. So the idea is one of intimacy. The one, um, you know, as we have good friends in our lives, we um, we confide in them. We tell them things that we don't tell other people. There's a level of intimacy and relationship that our friends, our closest friends, enjoy with us um, that we don't you know, share with just anybody. What David is saying here is that secret counsel, that, that confidant status, um, where there is this um, total intimacy and trust is enjoyed by those who fear God, it says, and then he makes them... Uh, makes known to them his covenant. You know, the, the, this is likely the Mosaic covenant that, um, that David is talking about, the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel after he pulled them out of Egypt, saying that if you want to um, live as my people, I've pulled you out by grace, and now you're going to live uh, in this land that I give you. And the sort of rules of living in that land, the, the response, the, 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 um, the gratitude, as it were, of living in the land, the way to, to acknowledge me in the land is to live according to the Ten Commandments and the other law that was delivered through Moses. And so um, what I think David's really pointing out here is that that law, that Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments that feels for us today a lot like do's and don'ts, okay, is really um, more than a performance-based promise to reward obedience. Um, there's a rich idea of intimacy here. Now remember, and we can never forget this, that God saved the Israelites out of Egypt through the Exodus prior to them doing anything for him. It wasn't as if he said, follow my Ten Commandments and then I'll pull you out of Egypt. He pulled them out of Egypt by signs and wonders, by mighty power, by grace. And he said, now that I've pulled you out, this is how you should live. Where God would love, protect, and cherish, and bless his children through the use of the covenant, not demand obedience in, in, in exchange for that love. He makes known to them his covenant. God reveals to us the deep things of who he is and the promise of his steadfast, enduring love. 
Finally, verse 15 says, My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. The fourth, pr fourth principle that we can get from today's reading is that God rescues those who depend utterly upon him. Utterly upon him. In the New Testament, the word for trust is pistis. That word can be translated as faith or trust or reliance or even dependence. This idea that we are casting everything we are and all of our hopes upon God. This is the faith and trust that God wants us to demonstrate as we live for him. David declares that he will continually focus his thought, mind, and will towards God in dependence. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. David emphasizes that God will save him um, and no one else or no other thing. So in the second line, it says, uh, my eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. In the Hebrew, David is using um, a, a syntax here that indicates that he's emphasizing God and not anything else. So in English, we would almost say it like this. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he, the Lord alone, will pluck my feet out of the net. It's interesting here that David uses this metaphor of the net because what it indicates is, is that David is being hunted. And I think that there's a trap set for him. And I think that we as human beings here and now, even in the New Testament, certainly just being followers of God, there are traps set for us. We, in some way, are being hunted. The world, the flesh, and the devil work together to set a trap for us, for God's children. And they each desire to exalt, that is the world, the flesh, and the devil, seek to exalt themselves against anything that would, um, uh, which ex is seeking to exalt itself against God and God's people. After all, the world wants to conform you to its standard. The flesh wants you to fulfill its sinful desires instead of God's will for your life. And the devil wants to distract your worship and your allegiance from God, from the one true God, the one in whom uh, we should be worshiping. The Bible says that the devil seeks to kill and destroy. He's a roaming lion seeking to devour whomever he can. There's a trap for us. There's something set out there for us. And God's telling you that when we utterly depend on him, when we focus and keep our eyes fixed on the cross, on Jesus Christ and what he's done in the hope for tomorrow, the promise for eternal life and the promise for deliverance even in the here and now, we can trust him. He will save us and he will rescue us. So keep focused on the God who promises to guide you, to bless you, to reveal himself to you, and to rescue you when you call out to him in faith. So God bless you. I hope that that was um, encouraging for you. Keep looking to God. Keep looking to God. Tomorrow we'll finish up Psalm 25 verses 16 through 22. And until we see each other then, shalom.